Good afternoon, everyone. Let's uh, just wait a couple more minutes. Uh, see who else shows up here. Stand by. So are we good to roll? I think we might not have a quorum yet. <clears throat> Looks like well, I was just looking. I We may, depending on who's standing in for who. Um, uh, Charlie, uh, you, you are the planning board's rep. Is that correct? Or no? Charlie, Charlie's with us. He's our staff. First oh, yeah. sorry. Oh, there you are, Charlie's. Yes. I've, I've even met with you. Uh, my apologies. Oh, it's no worries, but maybe one day I'll be the planning board rep. <laughs> <laughs> who, you know, who, who is the planning board rep now? Re refresh my memory. We have Shane Morrissey is the planning board. And I haven't heard. I thought he was on the yes list, so it might just be running a little late. And then um, I think we, we're going to have – Bob here from MDT, but I don't, perhaps Jacqueline or, or Vicki are, are sitting in for Bob. I'm sitting in for Bob, but I, I do have to leave at 2.30. Okay, we'll make sure we get through all the action items before then. Okay, and, all right. and, there's and uh, Aaron, I, I don't see Shane listed on our uh, array of voting members here on the agenda. Oh, I will make sure I get that fixed okay. and there was some some transitions in, in planning board over the last couple of months so we'll make sure we get shane added there and it, it looks like we probably have a quorum at this point so. okay well let's kick things off i'd like to call today's march 16th 2021 tpcc meeting to order let's start off with a roll call uh Mirta? present Maringan. I'm here. Welcome. Uh, Don MacArthur. And uh, Ryan, I'm assuming you're sitting in for Lucia. Indeed I am. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Slotnick will be late. I am Dave Strohmeyer, if folks don't know that. Uh, Jacqueline, you'll be sitting in for uh, Bob Boson as his proxy? Correct. And it appears as though Shane Morrissey is, are you out there? Present. Oh, excellent. Very good. And Debbie Johnston. She, she did I, let me know that she was going to be absent. She's traveling today. So. Okay. Very good. Did I forget anyone? All right. That's everyone. And I believe we have a quorum. So we have minutes to approve from February 16th. Are there any additions or corrections to those minutes? Seeing none, they will uh, be approved. Is there any public comment on items not on today's agenda? Okay, we are rolling. So we've got three items of new business today. And without further ado, let's get this kicked off. We have review and approval of amendment number four to the FY 20 to 24 uh, tip. And Charlie, it's yours. Hello, thank you. My name is Charlie Menefee. I'm a transportation planner with the MPO, and I will be presenting on the tips. Go ahead and share my screen real quick. I am happy I'm not presenting in person because I actually just had one of my water bottles bust open on my, my shirt. So looking good up top. But... That happens to the best <laughs> of us. Thanks. All right. 
So let's get into this. We are, are, are presenting tip amendment number four of FFY 2020-2024 tip, as well as a separate administrative modification number four to this tip. So for the admit, amendment number four section of this, we have one additional project. We have several project cost changes um, and a more in-depth update on mountain line funding. Um, and then we just have one project cost change for the administrative modification. So our first new project is in interstate maintenance and it is an epoxy striping project on I-90 for mile markers 93.5 to 105.2, as shown in this map here. Uh, and it will be costing $145,000 in FFY 2021 for project total. So now we're gonna get into project cost changes and these cost changes include major modifications. So those are projects that are past our threshold as defined by the MPO and our public participation plan. And then we have uh, more minor cost changes, which are administrative modifications and project de decreases that I will explain and call out as we go through them. So the first is congestion mitigation and air quality. And this is for a project called Purchase Street Sweepers. In this project, the uh, leasing of street sweepers was not procured in FFY 2020. Um, so this was reflected in a decrease in project expenditure of almost $1.6 million for those years. And project uh, street sweeper leases will be secured in following years of the TIP timeframe. So for interstate maintenance, Missoula to Bonner, um, the construction cost was increased by over $70,000, and this is just an administrative modification. National Highways Project funding segment, the Reserve Street Project from miles marker 0 to 5.3. This is a pavement preservation, which includes joint seal and grinding. Construction cost was increased due to more items being included on the bid. And this construction went up by almost $700,000, which is still an administrative modification as it only makes up a 7.6% total increase in project cost. Um, for surface transportation program off system and secondary, D D1 slopes to stability project phase three had a decrease in construction cost based on the latest estimates. So the project total went from $3.3 million down to $2.4 million. And that represents a decrease in total project cost of about 32%. In Highway Safety Improvement Program, we have two projects. And this first one is SF-129 Skid Treatment on East Missoula. Um, so this project was decreased by about $8,000. And then the second project, SF-169 East Missoula, Lolo East Missoula Safety Improvement, which includes many safety improvement sections, um, was decreased by um, almost $15,000 in construction for FFI 2020. Um, a big project cost decrease was steel bridge in our bridge funding section, steel bridge rehab corrosion one, um, and this was decreased by 30% to represent a total modification as, or increased, my apologies there, was increased by 30% as 30% of the total project areas are included in the MPO boundary. And this was increased um, in construction in FFY 2021 from almost $350,000 to almost $1.5 million. So the mountain line funding updates are a bit more comprehensive as we have received um, 
sort of just a holistic amount of updates on grants they received. So this update reflects the FDA's award of four separate grants to the urban transportation district to replace buses, associated equipment, and technical support. In total, these four grants will support the purchase of nine battery electric buses, and three of these buses will be owned and operated by the University of Montana through a subgrantee relationship. So the first funding section, which some of these grants were used for, um, as you see, there's many highlighted numbers that were updated. Um, one of the most important factors of this is that it is it has been explained that these sort of these funds are not in a 20 to 80 percent local federal match relationship. So our numbers were updated to reflect this. Um, we saw that the purchase of bus in replacement and wash equipment. So that is the second, the first project that was reduced in cost. Um, we also saw that our annual allocation from FY21 to FY2024 um, was set to equal for a total of $2 million, uh, $2,100,000 um, approximately. And we added a disclaimer to note that the match ratios of these projects can vary from 10% to 50% um, in local obligation. So the second funding section um, reflects similar changes based on these grants. And we have um, many updates to our bus stop amenities projects and um, Sort of the bulk of this is we received a total of almost $6.5 million in total for local and federal um, obligations of grants to help with our bus stops and amenities projects that will be committed in FY 2021. Um, and then there's similar increase in, or much smaller increases in project obligations for the remainder of the TIP time span um, in the, rem the remaining fiscal years. So that is an, uh, our holistic update of all of the project segments. Um, for our technical advisory committee, Transportation Technical Advisory Committee, we had a somewhat hasty approval of this. There was one note by Jeremy Keene to question um, how the funds were being reflected for the CMAC project funding section, the purchase of street sweepers. Um, and what we noted is that the $1.6 million will carry forward to cover project street sweeper leases in the future. Um, so this project or this amendment uh, followed our public notice as stated in the public participation plan. Um, so we set forth legal ads and provided all necessary information on our website and through digital media. Um, and we also informed TTAC and TPCC in a timely manner of this update. So now we're gonna step, or does anybody have any questions? on TIP Amendment 4. I'm gonna allow for questions and then we'll move on to um, the administrative modification for. Thanks, Charlie. Any questions, Mirta? Yeah, thank you. I probably know this because I know we had a conversation about this, but just can you remind me again, um, under CMAC um, and the sweepers, are we leasing the sweepers as opposed to purchasing because of that Married in America clause or policy? or has that gone away or will it go away under the new administration? Can you refresh my memory on that? Charlie or Aaron? I can't answer that directly. I do know that we are in the process of finalizing legal um, status for these street sweep releases. Um, and I think Aaron might be able to provide more 
in-depth answer on the causation with Made in America. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah. I, think, I think you're not far from the mark there, Mirta. Aaron, do you have anything more to share? Yep, uh, just to add that nothing has changed on our ability to get waivers for the, the requirements for steel and equipment. And there's still, as far as we know, is no sweeper on the market that meets that requirement. Um, and so the leases are, are mm. the way that we're able to, to get access to sweepers. Um, they're, we're not able to purchase them. And, and it's uncertain. I don't, I don't know if those waivers will change. I haven't heard anything indicating that the the changeover in administration is affecting whether they'll continue to apply those waivers or get back to allowing waivers for, for street sweepers that we were getting previous previously. So at this point, this is our, our best opportunity to provide some some funding and be able to help help re renew the sweepers for the city and the county. Yeah. Well, thanks. Well, thanks for bringing it up, Mierta. That's a good reminder because I think as we all engage our congressional delegation and we do have a new secretary of transportation. Um, so whether from a statutory or regulatory standpoint, I think we ought to uh, continue to push on uh, this being a change that we would like to see. Okay, Charlie, uh, if there's no other questions, continue on. Thank you, Dave. All right, we shall move on to administrative modification number four, which is just a single project. We received this update um, from MDT as of yesterday, and it is a minor project increase in, uh, of $145,000 for incidental construction in FFY 2021. So this is to be considered separate from the um, TIP 4 amendment um, and should be sought for approval by TPCC chair. The reason for this project cost increase has to do with a change in the construction of um, an attempt to use a duct to cross under the Clark Fork River, um, and a new method is thought to be the more preferred option. So, as Charlie, again, Charlie, could you just describe the process? Uh, since this is a little bit funky, uh, the administrative modification process, uh, how that will play out. Yes. Well, there it is. There it is. Okay. Yes. Um, so we received this notice yesterday, which um, as defined by our public participation plan, this is an administrative modification because the project cost increases only um, increase the project by 1.2% of the project total. So it does not meet our threshold to be a major modification. Um, and this requires approval of the TPCC chair, which is you, Commissioner Strohmeyer. And um, due to this, we can push this forward. So in a circumstance where we receive updates and it is just administrative modifications, we typically push these forward for approval and notice to TPCC and don't follow the um, sort of holistic amendment process that we have followed for TIP Amendment 4 as just previously presented. Um, what we provide is this information for TPCC board members to review and five days to submit any objection. Other than that, um, our director and the TPCC board um, can approve this and we push it forward to MDT. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. All right. So any questions on either tip amendment number four or the administrative modification number four? It looks like a canine might be weighing in. All right. Uh, well, a motion would certainly be in order, uh, and the motion before us today would be appro approval of amendment number four to the FY 20 to 24 tip as proposed, unless, of course, there are any proposed amendments. I would move the uh, motion. I'd move hey. the motion, I'd move the amendment, sorry. You can move whatever you want, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
That is in order. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion or public comment on the motion? Seeing none. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. That carries. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you all. I should. Okay, moving on. Uh, Aaron, are you going to introduce this? This is a review and approval of the East Missoula Highway 200 corridor plan. This has been a long time in coming and I am thrilled to uh, see us here today. Yeah, I, I don't have much to introduce. I'm gonna let John take the, the presentation and then if there are any other questions or uh, comments, I'll be here to have to answer, but John's gonna walk us through this adoption. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Um, is that full screen for y'all? Cool. Looks good to me, yeah. All right, my name is John Sand, a transportation planner with the Missoula Metropolitan Planning Organization. I am here to present the adoption of the East Missoula Highway 200 corridor plan, which we are also very excited about. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to take a moment on behalf of the MPO to thank um, the team at WGM Group for their awesome work on this project. Um, Kate, Kate Densmore, the project lead, and CASA did a great job with public involvement, and Stephen McDaniel was the uh, project in engineer on this corridor plan. Um, we started last uh, January and, you know, all the ch changes with COVID for open houses, I um, uh, just want to shout out to the team for adapting to those, those changes and um, still staying on schedule and having a really effective uh, public engagement process for, for this corridor plan. So thanks again um, to everyone at WGM Group for their awesome work on this project. So just a quick overview. I mentioned we started last uh, over a year ago, winter 2020 with project um, initiation and looking at past corridor plans. The most recent was the uh, 2015 East Missoula vision. Um, and so really building off of, of that, um, the first open house was in uh, February of last year. Folks had opportunity to engage through interactive map and um, notices sent out Via, via Facebook and email project lists. Uh, after that, there, into the spring and summer of 2020, uh, design alternatives were developed um, based on project goals um, and issues identified uh, by the public through the uh, previous engagement processes and earlier in the winter. Uh, again, interactive maps were used for this. Uh, we had a design preference survey uh, and postcards were sent out to the uh, corridor area for uh, additional engagement. Uh, this fall, the preferred alternative design was presented to the public um, with components of the multiple designs, design alternatives and um, just developed into a, a plan that best met the project goals. Another open house was conducted uh, during this step of the process, postcard mailer and um, Facebook and email notifications. So early 2021 spring, um, springtime is this final adoption process. So legal ads were run in the Missoulian throughout February and March, uh, letting folks know about the final comment deadline at the end of February. Um, this presentation <clears throat> was uh, of the draft plan was presented to East Missoula Bonner community councils throughout, throughout this process. Um, as well as notices on our website and social media. Some of the comments that came from the draft plan um, from, from community members, uh, shuttle service has always been, we've been hearing that since day one. So um, just keeping that, um, keeping that in mind, that's a big concern for, for folks around the fishing access there. Uh, folks were curious about why uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons were not proposed in the East Missoula corridor, and this is due to the 35 mile an hour speed limit and, and short uh, crossing distances. The Rattlesnake Transportation Committee submitted a letter that is included in the memo 
uh, in your today's meeting packet. So if you haven't had a chance to read that, I, I recommend you taking a look at that. And um, uh, they are um, just pointing out about the, the bike lanes versus cycle tracks throughout the Hell, Hellgate Canyon and um, uh, just some notes about the, the design of, of those cycle tracks. Um, the Missoula Institute for Sustainable Transportation also submitted uh, some comments and um, reiterating the safety of roundabouts and um, by, uh, active transportation network throughout the, the entire uh, project corridor. Um, some updates to the plan from comments, a lot to do with coordination from MDT. Um, uh, this has um, uh, affects anything from where the bus stops are going to be located. Uh, they're currently on uh, Speedway, and there's a proposal to move them onto Highway 200, which would require future coordination from MDT, uh, as well as right away limita limitations as that varies throughout the corridor project. And then um, coordination with MDT for their uh, shared use path best practices. Um, and that's related to concerns about driveways, uh, driveways crossing the shared use path along the, the Hellgate, Hellgate corridor. Um, next up for this project is a referral to uh, city council and then board of, of county commissioners TTAC approved uh, this uh, earlier in the month and so now we um, are asking for for your approval of this plan and staff recommendation is to adopt the east missoula highway 200 corridor plan and um, happy to ask answer any questions you may have you're on mute dave Yes, indeed. And slow at the draw with my mouse. All right. Uh, thanks, John. I appreciate that. Any questions from the committee? And I would just add thanks to staff and the consultants who worked on this and the, the public who commented. This, like I say, is a, a long time in coming and will provide a great blueprint, I think, for Moving into implementation, hopefully, and getting some work done on the ground. Uh, Mayor Engen. Uh, if you're uh, ready, Mr. Chairman, I would move adoption. Okay. Consider it done. That motion is in order. Is there a second? I'll second that. Ah, Commissioner Josh Slotnick has joined us. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Slotnick, for seconding that. Any discussion on the motion? Public comment. Okay, seeing none, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that carries. Thank you, everyone. So, John, is that already scheduled then uh, to come before the City Council and or the uh, Board of County Commissioners? Um, I believe, Aaron, did, the, uh, did it go to committee and last Wednesday? Yeah, we, we gave an update to... City Council Committee uh, last week, we haven't scheduled it for adoption yet. We wanted to get it through um, through the MPO first, and then we will be planning to, to bring it to both City Council and the County Commissioners for adoption sometime in the next couple of months, month or two. Okay. Yeah. Great. And it looks like Don MacArthur has joined us. Welcome, Don. Sorry to be late. Nope, that's okay. We're just getting rolling here. All right. So thank you again, John and Aaron. So moving on to our third item of new business. And this is brought to us by Aaron and Jennifer. Uh, this is an update on the long range transportation plan. Yeah, thanks. And hopefully you're not tired of us coming and talking to you every month about the long range transportation plan. It's, it's I think, a been sort of a ben maybe a benefit of COVID-19 and doing these uh, updates virtually is that we get the benefit of having Jennifer here just about every month, um, which is I think not something we would normally have under normal circumstances where um, we would have, have travel and, and a much more condensed sort of presentation schedule. So um, we're nearing the end now on the, the long range transportation plan update. Um, we 
last month we presented on our, our draft recommendations um, and, and work that we've been doing on the evaluation of the transportation scenarios. Uh, we got a lot of good feedback from, from committees and other folks on that, um, made some refinements and we have a sort of an update on, on that. And then we want to talk through some other elements of the, of the long range plan that aren't necessarily related specifically to projects and, and funding on the ground. And so, um, so we're going to quickly talk through and discuss the revisions we've made to those recommend, recommended scenario and the illustrative projects, um, get any last feedback. Um, and then we want to spend some time reviewing programs and policies. And we have some examples of, of what that could look like in the long range plan or what sort of programs and policies we might consider recommending. Um, and hopefully have some discussion about what, what all of you would like to see in the plan or ideas that you have that we should investigate further. Um, and then we'll kind of wrap up with a description of what we're currently doing with our, our engagement and outreach for the, the month of March. Um, and then uh, we'll have some next steps towards getting a draft plan ad adopted. Hopefully a little over a month, a month from now, we'll, we'll have that draft plan. We won't have it adopted by then, but um, the goal of, of getting this plan adopted sometime in the, the very near future. So that, that's kind of where we're at. And I will turn it over to Jennifer to get us started on the presentation. Great. Thank you, Aaron. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, good to see you all again. As Aaron mentioned, we're really going to focus in just quickly on the scenarios and projects today and are, are hoping for some good discussion with all of you around programs and policies. So I'll run through a couple of slides that just describe the changes that we have made since we saw you about a month ago. And then we'll pause for any questions around the projects and before we move into talking about money and programs. Um, so when we saw TPCC in February, we were in the midst of discussions with our technical advisory committee, with our citizens advisory committee, and then a handful of small group discussions with city and county staff. All of those were incredibly productive and resulted in a good number of changes to the recommended scenario and to our illustrative list of projects, which is exactly the reason for going through that activity. So I'm gonna highlight just a few of the things that we have adjusted over the last month before we started to take this recommended scenario out to the broader public for review. And then we'll take a quick look at what that and the illustrative project list look like right now. You do have included in your packet a map of the recommended scenario and the illustrative projects, as well as lists of both of those. And then I think you may also have a link to the interactive map, which is on the MPO's website. And certainly that continues to be a great tool for exploring the specific projects that are and aren't included in the recommended scenario. So a couple of the things that we have done in terms of making changes, we, we uh, first and foremost, created a standalone category for bridges. And part of the reason that we did that is because we really wanted to recognize that bridges are a very specific and special type of infrastructure that has different funding sources in some cases and serves a different purpose in the transportation system. So we felt it was important to really separate that category. So you'll see bridges reflected separately in both of those lists now. We also worked with city and county staff to split up a couple of projects. And one of the big ones that I wanna call out as an example is that we have separated the I-90 interchange from the Russell Street extension. Those projects remain as illustrative projects, but part of the reason that we did that is to really give the MPO as much flexibility as possible moving forward in seeking potential funding sources. And as we've talked about, being able to move projects between illustrative and recommended should opportunities arise. We also just really felt like having that connector by itself, the interchange by itself, provided opportunities as Howard Razor Drive, Complete Street might move forward. And then just really thinking about other connectivity in the North Reserve and Scott Street area, which is of course an area that is changing very, very rapidly. We flipped a handful of recommendations 
between illustrative and recommended. And one of those is in the River Road neighborhood. Um, we have moved Curtis Street to a recommended project and moved Johnson Street to illustrative. And part of the reason for that was just really ensuring that what we're recommending through the long range plan is consistent with what is part of the community discussions that have been underway and is included in local planning efforts as well. We've added the Wyoming Connector and Christian Drive Extension as illustrative projects. And then there were a handful of projects that we moved to illustrative from the recommended list. Those include the North Avenue bike lanes, the Lewis and Clark shared use path, and the North Side Bikeway and West Side Greenway Trail. Hey, Some Jennifer? Of those, yeah. yeah. Good hold up just a second. Josh, did you have a question? Oh, thank, thank you. Could, um, Jennifer, would you mind describing what the, what the recommended change is uh, for Curtis Street in the River Road neighborhood? I'm, I'm sorry if I missed that. Oh, no problem at all. We So we had Curtis Street included as an illustrative project, but based, and we had, um, and we had Johnson Street included as a recommended, but based on feedback from city staff and looking more closely at what community input had directed, we just switched those. So now we have Curtis Street as a complete street project in the River Road neighborhood and moved this Johnson Street spur to the illustrative list. And the change to Curtis would be making it a complete street. Absolutely, yes. yes. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Okay, go ahead, Jennifer. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, that switch between projects that were on the recommended list and have moved to illustrative was really about making sure that projects that were the highest priority do sit on the recommended list, but we weren't losing projects on the illustrative list unless there was something that had been determined to be really outdated or infeasible. And we did get rid of a couple of outdated projects, including the Bitterroot Spur Connection and the Lower Miller Creek Bridge. And again, that's all based on feedback from our various committees. So those are a few of the changes that we made. So what that leaves us with the recommended scenario that you see illustrated here on this map and also included on the list in your packets. And there's a couple of things that I wanna highlight in terms of the recommended scenario. So as we talked about at our last meeting, we really focused on prioritizing all types of projects. The recommended scenario includes projects for every mode, whether for people walking or rolling or biking, for freight and auto traffic, and then also for transit. It was really important to us that as we continue to move projects between recommended and illustrative, we were holding that to be the case so that the recommended scenario does indeed prioritize inward and strategic growth. It advances equity, but then also really tries to maximize the investments that the region is already making. So hopefully you can see that reflected in the projects that are included here. Just a few of the important complete streets connections that I would mention are Johnson Street, Howard Razor Drive, Russell Street, and then of course the project that you've just approved, the East Broadway and Highway 200 project. We also really tried to focus on some of the regional and inner neighborhood active transportation facilities, including the I-90 trail, the Third Street bike lane, and the Lower Miller Creek path. So we tried to strike that balance between focusing inward, but also making some of those really important regional connections. Erin, are there any other projects that you particularly wanna highlight on the recommended scenario? No, I, I think those are some of the key, but another good one might be the, the Brooks Corridor that we know, you know that's in, in the recommended project list. I, I think that is a, a fairly high profile and will be a really key transformative project. Um, and then other ones like the, the front main convert to a conversion and Higgins corridor being other sort of really key improvements that will really potentially transform those those areas and, and help support growth and, and other plans that we have um, that we're, we're trying to move forward like the downtown master plan um, or what we hope to have is the midtown master plan if, if that that process gets up and running. Great. So then I'll share a couple of the illustrative projects with you all as well, just as a reminder. So again, with our illustrative list, we try and capture everything that is not included in the recommended scenario. And we do want this to be a really comprehensive list. 
Um, as I mentioned before, we did some movement between illustrative and recommended as we continued revising. And the importance again of the illustrative list is that it is projects that are beyond the fiscal constraint, but it is a list that provides the region with flexibility moving forward. So as new federal dollars become available, as there are new private dollars available, we've got the ability to move projects to recommended or move them forward in a variety of different ways. There are some really important projects to the region that remain on the illustrative list because they just don't fit within the funding constraints. And again, examples of those are the I-90 interchange that I talked about, um, the Riverfront Triangle non-motorized bridge, which is one we've spoken about before, and then also Mullen Road widening are a couple of the bigger projects that remain as illustrative, but are not currently recommended at this time. So that is what we wanted to share in terms of the projects portion of this. Um, let me pause there for any questions or comments about the recommended or illustrative list before we move on to programs. Thanks, Jennifer. Any questions, comments at this point? Okay, Jennifer, proceed. Okay, great. So we will move ourselves on and talk just a little bit about funding before we, we talk about programs and policies. So Aaron, you wanna talk about the dollars? Yeah, and this is kind of just a, a, a brief overview of what we are starting to look at in terms of our revenue projections over the next 30 years, um, where that funding is coming from and, and what types of improvements or investments it's going towards. And, and I think we gave a little bit of an overview of our, you know, just this idea that funding is really shifting from federal funding down to local, um, state and local governments to help fill the gap that, that we've, that's been growing over the last several, several decades, I think. Um, but over the next 30 years, we're projecting or estimating uh, revenue and on the order of about $1.3 billion, um, which sounds like a lot, but goes really fast, as we all know, with these kinds of infrastructure projects. About 50% of that funding is federal, so that averages about $22 million a year. Uh, the rest is, is coming from local sources like the gas tax and our, our TIF districts um, and, and property taxes like the, the road district. Um, once, once we break out all of the committed projects and funding sources that go to dedicated things like street maintenance, um, or uh, state programmed federal funds, we're left with about $181 million that we consider discretionary. So those are funds that either the MPO programs or the city or county um, have some discretionary authority to program and, and could potentially be invested in infrastructure projects. Um, the way our revenues are currently programmed, about 30% or about a third of that goes to transit. And, and a, a big chunk of that are dedic those dedicated funding sources like our FTA, federal funds, or the, the mill levy. Um, and, and something that I, I think is worth pointing out related to transit, it's, it's a little bit of a different funding source or, or different funding um, way, way of looking at funding than some of the other types of, of investments because it does include operating costs and capital costs. Um, things like, you know, purchasing vehicles and operators um, that we don't necessarily capture, you know, on the, the individual side or, or single occupancy vehicle or, or even biking or um, walking that those other kinds of you know, household purchases of vehicles are not included in, in this, for instance, but it, for transit, we are including things like bus purchases and, and operator costs. So it's a little bit hard to compare those in, in some ways, but um, and then about 26% of the, that funding is, is going towards maintenance, um, and then the rest go toward, primarily towards capital improvements, and then a very small portion currently is set towards uh, programs, things like our um, street sweepers, uh, or Missoula in Motion, or our van pool services, things like that. Um, so it's a small amount, and that's, I think, one of the things we want to talk about today are sort of how much do we want to in shift this investment and invest in things like programs or maintenance or, or transit. I think that's one of the sort of final decisions we have to make is how much do we want going towards new capital in improvements versus some of these other potential investments. So we might pause there for a second as well and see if the committee has any thoughts about that allocation between 
what we spend on new capital projects versus what we spend on maintenance. This is a question we're asking the public right now through the round of engagement we have underway. But if, if this committee has any thoughts or direction they would want to provide to the project team, we'd certainly appreciate it at this point. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Josh. So I'm just kind of parroting Dave Wood. I've heard <clears throat> Shane, our, our uh, public works director, say that the unmet need is growing faster than our ability to meet it. I, don't, I can't pretend to know how that fits into this pie chart or what we should be doing. I'm not an expert in this, but his words do ring in my ears when thinking about answering Jennifer's question. And uh, also, you're kind of parroting what Shane says when we don't keep up with maintenance on our roadways, the cost of bringing them up to the right level of quality in actually increases. It's not the same broken thing deterioration and it costs more. So uh, maybe we need to think about expanding that chunk of the pie chart, but I'd leave it to more experts. I'm just, I'm just parroting what I've heard our experts actually say. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Mirta? Um, I guess my question is for um, Jennifer. In, in your experience, do other communities like Missoula that are in the same track in terms of development and growth, um, do they have a similar pie chart? Can you think of other communities where they do this? Um, just to get an idea of, you know, what other communities similar to Missoula are, what do they look like when they spend, when they have this pie chart or something similar to this versus some other ones that might have a different one and, and what will we expect those communities to look like? It's a really interesting question. And I think the response is that you will find percentages that are all across the map. What we're seeing more and more right now is an increase in funding toward maintenance. And some of that gets to the point that Josh was just making, deferred maintenance. I mean, you can think about it as just paying the minimum monthly payment on your credit card each month. It just gets worse and worse if you don't take care of it. So we have started to see an increase in maintenance. The other key thing that we're seeing, and this is especially true in communities like Missoula, where you're seeing a lot of growth, you're seeing a lot of development, the shift in the type of capital projects that are being developed with, you know, whether it's 41% or a little bit less of funding is moving more and more toward the lower cost projects that reconfigure roadways as opposed to building new roadways or building major pieces of infrastructure. The focus on affordability across the board and then really leveraging private development to help with some of the more expensive, the new infrastructure projects is a trend that, that we are seeing more and more. I would say that communities are trying to be really conscientious about positioning themselves for those big federal opportunities that come around once in a while, whether that's a build grant, as you all have obviously taken advantage of, whether it's a future infra grant, whatever that might be, communities are looking more and more toward seizing that opportunity and then using the funds that come to them on a regular basis for a lot more of the lower cost investments. Thanks, I appreciate the perspective. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, it did occur to me if uh, to what extent some of the percentage of capital improvements would be capital improvements to existing infrastructure that is currently uh, incurring maintenance costs such that uh, uh, over the long haul, we might actually do that reconstruction, uh, uh, decrease some of the maintenance costs that would other be in, otherwise be in the blue piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions or comments? Dave, maybe I, the, one other thing I would maybe mention related to that in maintenance is that we're, I think at the city level and I suspect at the county level as well, we're getting a lot better at at managing all of our right of, sort of public infrastructure in the right of way to, to maximize those investments. So for instance, prioritizing utility improvements that are in the same location as a, a roadway, you know, somewhere where we need to replace the asphalt or do some, some roadway repair and maintenance. And so we get some, some benefit out of that. And so it might look like we're investing not as much in our transportation dollars, but when you factor in some of those other utility investments, we're actually 
increasing the amount of maintenance that we might otherwise be doing. So there's that, that kind of benefit that we're getting as well. Sure. Don. Um, maybe you described this, Jennifer and Aaron, but I'm still a little confused. Um, in the, is, the, is the discussion about the allocation of our 181 million of discretionary, whether we should be moving it you know, more heavily into blue or yellow? Is that, is that the question? At Aaron or Jennifer? Yeah, at its root, Don, it is. You, you have some flexibility within those discretionary funds to be able to program more on the maintenance side than you do on the new, the new projects or the capital improvement side. Not everything is flexible within those funding sources, but that is, that is the, the most flexible of the dollars available. I mean, I guess that was my, my sort of the root of the question is so much of the monies are not flexible. Um, and so we're, we're just talking about the little bits at the edges that allow us to shape our community the way, you know, maximally benefiting our values. Um, and I, you know, I did some quick math and I was thinking, well, that's $6 million a year. If you just take 30 years, 180 million, um, is that right? Something like that. Uh, it's not a lot of money. Right. Um, you know, we can do a few sidewalks or, you know, one little piece of road or uh, fix up a few um, potholes. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that is, there is truth in that for sure. Remember that the 181 million is in addition to the funds that are for the committed projects, which we show. So that's in the neighborhood of 120 million that's committed over the next five to six years. And then certainly there are, there's that bigger pot of federal dollars and local dollars, of course, which amounts to, I wanna say in the neighborhood of 22 million a year. Yep, it says it right there on the slide in front of me. I was just trying to remember that. So about 22 million a year in the federal funds. And, you know, I think what's important about that in terms of this allocation is it's, it's true, Don, that this is not all flexible, but being able to set that priority in terms of how you want to invest can also signal to your partners, whether, whether it's the state, whether it's private partners, how you want to prioritize funding and how you're thinking about your system. So even if it is a relatively small dollar amount that you actually get to play with, I think the signal in terms of how you're prioritizing your investments and what matters most to the MPO and to the region is part of what's important. I mean, I guess that, and to, to sort of follow on to the actual question that you posed, it seems, it seems very difficult to determine what the right percentage of maintenance to capital improvements is. And, you know, from my own perspective, and I think what I've heard from others on the committee, it seems like um, we certainly want to maintain what we have, um, at least the good parts or the parts that we want to endure of what we have um, in, a, in a robust way. And then on the other hand, we also want to grow in ways that are good for the community too. So there's no either or, right, for I think any of these things. It's sort of an ongoing um, balancing act. And I guess maybe the question out of all that is, how do you how do you sort of judge whether you're balancing right? I I would say there are a handful of the metrics that that you all have helped to establish through this planning process that are one tool for helping to make some of those decisions about whether whether you're doing it right. So you've established clear goals for the long range plan, and as we look at how the region is progressing toward those goals over the years that's gonna be an important thing to track. So what percentage of our system is in a state of good repair versus fair versus poor? How many people are walking, biking and taking transit? So getting to your mode share goals, right? Are the ways that we are investing, the types of projects we're investing in, are those helping us to move the needle toward our goals? So, you know, those are, those are a couple of the metrics that come immediately to mind in terms of what we need to be tracking. But the other piece of it is tied to the, the asset management system that I think Aaron presented to this group on a few months back and, you know, sort of what you're seeing in terms of the overall maintenance burden of the region and balancing that with all of the other needs. And Aaron, you, you probably have more to say about that as well. 
No, I mean, I think that's the, that's the gist of it. The, the other piece is just thinking again about how we grow impacts these things. You know, how many households are paying into each roadway, maintenance of each mile of roadway. Um, you know, if it's 10 houses per, per mile, you know, that's a much higher cost to maintain than if it's 100 households per mile. I mean, just pulling numbers out of a hat. But just thinking about how we grow and how efficient our system is and how compact we are, you know, because you're, you're growing your, your tax base, you're able to spread those costs over more households, you can reduce the, the burden that way and just sort of your overall investment in transportation. So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind as, as we continue to grow that there is a cost associated with maintaining that growth. Um, and we need to be thoughtful about that. And I think what, uh, what both you, Jennifer and Aaron said makes a great deal of sense. Uh, it, it's a little more difficult for me right here now to say that we ought to shift a few percentage points uh, uh, into maintenance or capital improvement. And, and all of this is in the face of the fact that uh, perhaps by as early tomorrow, our, our very own state legislature might strip from us our ability to use local option gas tax for some of our maintenance. So, Commissioner Slotnick. Hey. Um, I, I was just going to say, I like uh, some of the language in here, here uh, not either or and balancing act that really resonated with me. It's easy to imagine a new construction actually having <clears throat> a, a maintenance benefit if the new construction <clears throat> reduces the load or burden on the existing roadway. Somewhat what we're kind of hoping to see in the build area. So maybe the maintenance need on some of the existing roads out there becomes less acute because now we've diverted traffic so it isn't uh, it isn't super clear cut, and I think this sort of thing actually kind of has to be a little bit ad hoc, a little bit balancey, and we need to be looking at conditions on the ground continually rather than a pie chart saying, "Oh, 41 isn't right. We should be at 44 because that's what they're doing in King County." That, that's, that's, I don't think that's the right way to solve this. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Mayor Engen. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So. It, uh, at the risk of being an optimist, um, <laughs> I, I am. Uh, that is not allowed today. <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, so so uh, uh, in President Biden's rescue plan, uh, supported mightily by Senator Tester. Um, there will there will be uh, considerable resources allocated to the state of Montana. And I'm wondering, Jacqueline, if uh, if you have any insight or our federal friends have any insight as to what those raw numbers look like. We're also anticipating what I'm hearing, at least um, from federal staff, is uh, is an actual infrastructure bill. Um, I think our advocacy will follow our advocacy around Rescue Act. So there would be direct allocations to uh, to local jurisdictions to deploy those funds. Um, and the Rescue Act also um, provides uh, for, um, for uh, investment in uh, uh, water and wastewater utilities, which often, um, which often uh, are part of transportation infrastructure. So there are some opportunities there where we can look at um, those utility projects and how they align with uh, our transportation projects. Um, and really double down. So there's a chance that we can get more, much more done than we're imagining here. Um, and, and having, I think, this, this, uh, this set of priorities um, and, and <clears throat> having those priorities aligned with community values will serve us well moving forward as some of those resources come our way um, in, in ways that are uh, unprecedented. And I like saying unprecedented um, without saying pandemic or times um, <laughs> around them. Well, that, that was an awfully sunny uh, sort of uh, uh, preface there. Uh, so so uh, to follow on the mayor's question, uh, uh, Jacqueline or Ryan, uh, anything that you'd like to add from uh, your state or federal perspective? Well, I guess maybe I'll start. Um, I mean, I think Maringen did a good job capturing some interesting flexibilities that might be uh, able to be brought to bear with some of these pots of funding. Um, you know, obviously the, the state legislature will have something to say about how the transportation money is spent also. Um, as for the infrastructure bill, I mean, the, <laughs> of 
you know, as many of you know, we've been talking about a infrastructure bill for quite some time. Uh, and I think there's, you know, <laughs> different folks might have different things to say about how much more or less likely it is going forward, but there's still a lot to, to find out about how big it is and, and what kind of uh, flexibilities might be built in with that one. But I mean, I do, I like the optimism and I don't think it's misplaced. I mean, I say that less as a, uh, a staff member of the Federal Highway Administration and more just as a citizen. I mean, I, I think there is reason to be optimistic at some levels, even if there's reason to be pessimistic at others. Um, how's that for an editorial comment? <laughs> I, I think that, I think that's great, Ryan. And I, you know, the, the, you know, the beauty is uh, what's different today is uh, we can count to 51. Um, and that wasn't the case before. So um, that that's where part of my op optimism, optimism comes from. And Jacqueline, one of the things I, uh, this is a big round number that's in my head as a function of, um, of uh, Rescue Act, but I have $10 billion in my head um, for transportation and infrastructure in the state. Is that at all reasonable? I, I do not know the numbers okay. at all. And, and I don't know how it'll be split up between the different programs we have. Okay. Thank you. Well, we'll roll with that today. 10 billion it is. So <laughs> thanks, we'll John. That, we'll see that on the news tonight. So <laughs> <laughs> means it's real. I, I, I think that 10 billion is coming from a tax increment finance district. Is it not here in Missoula? Uh, Helena. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, anything else uh, before we continue on? And, and, and Aaron, uh, did we still want to talk a little bit about programming and policy? Yes. And that meant perfect transition uh, as we, we move into our, the next set of our slides. And I, I think we'll maybe just leave this here that I think this has been a really helpful conversation around the funding and we can help establish some of those priorities and some of those points that, you know, regardless of the percentage of funding that, that our goals and our, our programs are in alignment with, with what all of you are saying about how we want to proceed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is great. Thank you all. And when we come back next month, we'll be talking a little bit about ways that we can grow this pie. So some of the federal opportunities are great, but what else can be done at a, at a local level? What could be pursued at a state level to help move that forward? So the last piece that we wanted to talk about for a few minutes today was around the programs and policies element of the long range plan. And as we've talked about before, investments in infrastructure are critical, investments in maintenance are critical, but those investments alone are not going to move the region all the way toward the ambitious mode share goals that you've set. So the programs and policies can be an important piece of helping to do that. They are part of improving the system as a whole. Lots of different types of programs and policies that we'll talk about today. Some focus on safety, others focus on encouragement. A lot of the work that Missoula in Motion does fits right into that encouragement bucket, helping people see their options, incentivizing and disincentivizing travel in different ways. But ultimately the programs and policies are intended to complement the infrastructure and get people thinking a little bit differently about what their options are. So a couple of examples, we're gonna spend a little bit of time today talking about these first three bullets and using some case studies from other jurisdictions just to help think about how these programs and policies could work in the Missoula region. But the plan itself will include a couple of dozen potential recommendations for programs and policies. And those include programs like Safe Routes to Transit, Safe Routes for Seniors, which build on the idea of a Safe Routes to School program. Um, we also have been talking a lot about the importance of passenger rail. Certainly, I know this is important to several of you and thinking a little bit more about what the long range plan might recommend in terms of interregional connections, passenger rail studies, and other other sort of bigger projects that don't necessarily fit just within the jurisdiction of the MPO, but are critically important for connectivity across the region. So I, I think that a couple of you may have some thoughts on that one that you'd like to share as we go forward as well. 
So I'll give just a couple of quick spotlights and happy to, to pause for some questions as we go through each of these or discussion. Um, one of them that, so this example comes from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And these are some excerpts from their Vital Streets Plan. What the Vital Streets Plan does is identify street types for the entire city of Grand Rapids. And in addition to just identifying street types, which are a way to really connect the transportation and land use function of a particular street or corridor, the Vital Streets Plan actually goes to the level of detail of identifying the modal priority for a street. So is a street a freight priority street? Is it a bike priority street? And then also sets design standards for all of those different street types. The reason that we're highlighting this as a potential program for the long range plan is that it really builds on work that you're already doing in the Mullen area. And it seems like it could be something that more broadly would be really useful for the city, would be really useful for the county as you think about the ways that you wanna prioritize infrastructure investments and the ways that you want to further connect land use and transportation. Any questions or comments on that or Aaron, anything you wanna add on this one? Well, the only thing I would add is something like this helps, I think it, it one, it helps us sort of focus our, our goals and our objectives and what we want out of our transportation system, but it also increases the predictability. So you're not waiting until a development comes through to say we need these design standards that it should increase the predictability of, you know, this is the purpose of this street. These are the kinds of design elements we need to achieve that purpose. And then whether it's a public project or private development, you are further ahead than you would be um, and, and really I think maximizing your, your time and, and having sort of less, um, less time spent going into design and making changes and, and trying to hash out the details when you're trying to get a project constructed. And so I think there's some efficiency to be gained there um, later on if you do the work up front. So uh, Jennifer or Aaron, how heavy of a lift would this be to, to, to do within our planning area? It, it, let's see. That's a tricky question. The, the, most, the most challenging piece of it, honestly, is so establishing the street types and saying, okay, we've got six different street types that we're gonna use within the city of Missoula. And then we have another four street types that are more appropriate for the larger planning area for the county. That piece is, is really not what is tricky about doing this. And even setting the design standards is, there's a lot to build from. There's a lot of great work you all have already done that could be pulled in relatively simply. Where the Vital Streets Plan really takes that next step and what is the bigger level of effort is, is assigning those street types to individual streets and sort of making the commitment that you know, in this in this graphic from Grand Rapids that Fuller, for example, is a freight priority street and Aberdeen is a bike priority street. And I'm just making that up, but that requires some community engagement and a level of involvement that, that does take a little bit more time and energy than just establishing the types and the design standards. Sure, Don? Jennifer started to answer some of my questions, but I was uh, also wondering whether this gets overlaid into greenfield areas that are not yet uh, have don't yet have streets. Uh, is it a planning tool or is it just a, a sort of a, a evolution of street tool? It can be either, Don. Um, you know, many communities set these types of set street types for future development as well, whether that's greenfield development or brownfield development in some cases. So yes, it, it can be used, street types can be used as a, a tool to retrofit or as a tool to plan ahead. I mean, the, the example that's on the screen in front of us, if you don't have the right of way and the, and the building setbacks to have big front yards, you know, you're not getting it unless you do it as a planning uh, exercise rather than as a, um, than a retrofit exercise. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and so you can think about it, like if you're doing it as a planning exercise, that gives you the ability to get that right of way and to dictate how much space you're going to have. If you're doing it as a retrofit ex exercise and you do actually have some right of way, it just helps you think about how you can reallocate it to meet your goals differently and to move different modes in different ways. So, so yes, I would agree with you. You don't just magically get the space to do everything that you want to do if you don't have if you don't have that right of way dedicated or you can't get an easement or you know work with the property owners in some other way. Thanks for that question, Don. Mirta? Um, Jennifer, do you, do you think that something like this, say in the Mullen area, uh, uh, the Mullen planning area, uh, Satapkin, would this be like an enhancement or additional detail information um, for each one of those transects that are associated to form-based code, for example? Is this something that, because we already have something in the code um, that um, I think defines what, for each one of those transects, what a street will look like. Um, but would this be another layer that we could use to refine that or would it complement it? Or how do you see that working for form-based code, thinking that at some point we might want to go that route for an area greater than just the Mullen area. Yeah, I would, Erin, I would invite you to chime in here too, because you're obviously more familiar with what's happened in the Mullen area. But, but I think part of the reason, Mirta, that we are interested in this as a recommendation from the long range plan is that it could help to apply what you've already started to do in the Mullen area throughout other parts of the region. So, t you know, going to the level of form based code is a level of detail that you're not necessarily going to get into region wide, but being able to take elements out of that and apply them in terms of street types and design standards, I think is a, a very reasonable thing to think about doing across the region. Yep, I, I would agree. And I, I think we're already pretty close to this with the Swatip Kane uh, area master plan that that we've got street typologies and we have design standards specific to those. There's some modes assigned to them, maybe not at the, the level that this goes to. And so there may be some additional work we wanna do if we want to, wanted to expand that to the whole city. And, and obviously it's primarily all greenfield. And so you have the ability to say, this is the street and this is the right of way and this is what you need to include. And once you start looking at existing facilities like Jennifer mentioned, you know, you're, you're constrained. And so there are some different kinds of trade-offs that, that you wanna work with, but. Yeah, it, feel, it feels like an extension of, of the work that we've already started. Thanks, Aaron. And I think that's what I was getting at in my original question is uh, just in terms of a level of effort here, there are places where we're probably closer to actually having this uh, realized on paper and in the planning process than in other areas of town. Mm -hmm. Shall we move on to another? Yes, go right, right ahead. So the next is a, is a combination program and policy spotlight. And this is something that we teed up for this committee, I wanna say last summer, when we started talking about some early programmatic recommendations from the long range plan. So this particular example comes from Eugene, Oregon, and it is a transportation demand management action plan. So there are elements of what Eugene has done that are really similar to what you already have in place in Missoula or that present the opportunity to build on what's in place in the Missoula region. And part of the reason that we like this particular example is because it brings so many different things together. So Eugene, aside from having some really interesting similarities to Missoula, actually big university town, um, they have done a lot of planning that is very similar to the work that you've done in the region. They have set very ambitious mode share goals. They've got a relatively recent transportation system plan. They've got a vision zero plan, so a focus on safety, and they've set some very strong goals around climate. So there is that planning and policy background and backing much like you have. What they've done through this set of tools that are included in their action plan is really focus on bringing everything together. So the TDM action plans or the transportation demand management action plans require developments and employers of a certain size to prepare to implement and to monitor transportation demand management plans. So I think that's an important opportunity for Missoula as you think about new developments going in as you think about major employers coming to the region. 
how do you how do you enforce that requirement that a TDM plan be established and then monitored? Another interesting thing they've done in, in Eugene is the traffic impact analysis actions that they've taken. So traffic impact analysis being tied to new development, they have expanded the measurement of development's impacts beyond just the typical vehicular level of service. And so that means that they are looking at the review of walking and biking improvements as part of looking at a new development. They also actually focus on connections to nearby networks. So it's not just about looking at what the development is likely to do or what improvements the development is making, but really thinking about the broader connectivity. And that includes reviewing safety at nearby intersections which is something that not very many communities do as part of their traffic impact analysis. So those couple of pieces are really important. I think the other thing that Eugene has really focused on, and you know, this is important for communities that are seeing a lot of development, is trying to make the process clear and then giving developers a menu of options. We often hear from developers that you know, they, they wanna do something different. They want to think creatively about how to solve these problems but the menu of choices that they can select doesn't allow them to be flexible and to be creative. And so part of what Eugene has done is said, okay, we're gonna give you a list of things that you don't even have to ask us for special approval for. And it really helps to streamline the development process and it helps to streamline the review by city staff, which is another, of course, big, <laughs> big time commitment when it comes to a, a place that has a lot of development underway. So this is a way, again, to build on what's already working in Missoula, and I think to take the next step with a lot of the TDM work that you have underway. Aaron, Thanks. anything you want to add? And and Aaron, just so that we apportion our uh, our remaining time, uh, how are we doing? I, I think we're looking pretty good. We just have one or two more slides. Okay. So Thanks. Any good. questions uh, or Aaron? Do you want to add, add anything here? No, it just, you, you know, I think this, we've talked a lot about this and how we integrate some of this into our, our code and, and be more mm. sort of at the same time, more flexible, but also encouraging meeting our goals more, you know, not just saying that we have one approach to every single development. It came up a lot during the downtown master plan about, you know, how do we address growth? Is it bringing parking requirements back or is it doing something different? And I think this is a way to to really offer that flexibility that there, there are impacts to development, but there is a whole host of ways that we can mitigate that. And it, it feels like Missoula is entering a period where we're much more, it, it's gonna be easier to do some of this, especially with the mountain lines service extension, be, having evenings and weekends and, and in, increasing transit access um, in ways that it really wasn't before to anyone outside of a nine to five schedule. And so those changes I think are really gonna help elevate some of these, these opportunities and and I think it ties into other things like having car share or emerging mobility or some of these other tools sort of really highlighting those as opportunities in development to mitigate that, that transportation impact as opposed to just saying you have to do add an extra lane somewhere or add a signal or provide a, a parking garage, you know, as sort of our limited tool set. So I think this is a much more interesting way to go about it and comprehensive way. Thanks. Don? Uh, two questions, I guess. One is, um, how do we get from where we are now to to this plan? And two, um, how many people does it take to sort of administer or, or keep the plan rolling over the course of each year? So what is our, what's a staffing requirement and what's the investment to get from where we are to, to having the plan? Aaron or Jennifer? Aaron, do you want me to start? Yeah, you can start it now. Okay. So, you know, the first piece would be really shaping what the transportation demand management policy looks like for whether you want to do it on a city scale, whether you want to do it at a county scale, whatever that might look like. And, you know, in terms of a, a dollar investment for that, we've been having some conversations with Aaron about what that might look like. It is probably in the $60,000 range, sixty dollars to $70,000 range, I think, to take that next step. What it requires in terms of staffing, I mean, the, the ideal with a plan like this 
is that yes, you, you likely are going to need another staff person at some point, especially in terms of monitoring the TDM plans that are in place for employees. But the idea is that because you are streamlining the development review process, you actually get some staff savings in many cases as well. So, you know, Eugene, I think has added, they added one more full-time person sort of immediately to be able to, to administer the program, but have seen savings in other ways. They're able to process applications a lot more quickly. So it's, it's, I don't want to say it's a net X number of people for sure, but you, you are right that you do need some additional staff to really monitor and enforce as you move forward. Yeah, and part of, part of the process that I think we need to go through initially is just evaluating that, you know, evaluating our current code and sort of where are we putting staff resources in our development review today? Where can we streamline that through something like this? What additional staff time might be necessarily necessary early on versus long term? And then looking at our existing resources, I mean, I, I think we do have a, a really good base for, for doing something like this through our existing TDM programs. We're already working with employers who are willing and interested and in, in helping them draft plans and helping them set up monitoring. We, we have that expertise um, in a way that I think a lot of communities our size don't have. And so I think we're, we're ahead of the game in that respect. And, and this is just sort of trying to focus us in um, identify what those those next steps to start integrating it are. Thanks. All right. All right. Okay. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna I'm just gonna skip through the next one so we have time to talk a little bit about engagement. But just so you all know, another thing that we are including as part of the long range plan is what we call an emerging mobility playbook, which looks at the ways that the Missoula region can prepare for changes in transportation technology, in new mobility services that are coming. And we have an example from, from Seattle that while a much bigger city is applicable in terms of really setting the, the groundwork for how you engage with private mobility providers, whether that's car share, whether it's scooter share, whether it's autonomous vehicles in the future. So really thinking about the ways that the region can be positioned to take advantage of changing technology and not just be in a position of having to respond to it. So we'll certainly talk more about that as we move forward. Um, so wanted to share with you all where we are in terms of community engagement and we are engaging with the public on the recommended scenario. We're engaging with people on the questions of funding that we talked with you about a little bit earlier. And then we have a handful of program and policy ideas that we're asking people to help prioritize as well. So our website has been updated. We have a short online survey that invites people to chime in on those three topics. And then we are hosting two virtual open houses next week. One is on Wednesday evening, so from 6 to 7.15. And then the other is Thursday in the middle of the day. There'll be the same information at both, but we wanted to provide a couple of options for people to come and engage with the project team, talk a little bit more about projects, programs, and policies, and then ask any questions as well. So this round of engagement takes us through the end of March. And then we are moving forward at the same time to develop the draft long range transportation plan, um, which we intend to release at the end of April for public review through May, and then hopefully come back to this body for consideration of adoption in June. So those are our next steps as we move forward. Any other okay. questions today? Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. And since you brought it up earlier, and since we are talking about policies today, uh, I will uh, avail myself of the opportunity to say a few words about rail. Uh, as some of you know, I am the chair, chairman of the Big Sky Passenger Rail Authority. And what's been impressed upon me by both Amtrak and also the Federal uh, Railroad Administration and, and others is the importance of having an MPO's long range transportation plans, whether it's Missoula or anywhere else, reference to uh, passenger rail, even if it's uh, aspirational and uh, uh, multi-years out, it's, uh, it's critical, I think, to position ourselves for those future opportunities to have it referenced. And, and maybe it relates somewhat to your slide about Seattle. I ha have not had a chance to uh, look at, at the, uh, the text in uh, any detail beyond what you just flashed on the screen, but thinking about 
intermodal connectivity and 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 just how uh, a larger regional transportation system links up with uh, options locally to get around in that first and last mile of travel. I think this is uh, uh, part and parcel of that. Any other, uh, the mayor has had enough. He just got up. Uh, any other uh, questions, comments? Nothing. Well, this, this is all really good work and I appreciate you coming month after month, Jennifer, because uh, this is, this has been one of the more robust uh, long range transportation planning processes that I've been a part of. So much appreciated. Great, thank you very much. We will look forward to talking about new funding sources. And I think next month, Aaron, as well, we might bring some suggested priority recommendations for this group. That's great. Okay, all right, great. Thank you okay. all. Thanks everyone. We have no old business. Any other announcements or closing comments before we adjourn? Yeah, just have one um, on behalf of the planning board. Uh, we've had some discussions uh, recently about uh, some safety concerns down on Highway 93 uh, from essentially the Rivoli County line to Blue Mountain. And we were wondering if the MDT would uh, be willing to come and speak with the planning board at some point. So they asked me to bring it up here um, at the TPCC meeting and see if that was a possibility. Yeah, anyone from in, uh, from uh, the Montana Department of Transportation want to take that? I know that uh, that your folks have met with the Lolo Community Council, uh, not infrequently, but would you be willing to meet with the planning board? Um, Jacqueline had to leave, so I'm not going to commit her to anything, but I will share that information, Shane, and make sure that she gets in, ch in touch with you. Thanks so much. Mm-hmm. This was actually the opportune time to commit her to something, yeah. but uh, <laughs> thanks, Shane. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, anything else from anyone? Okay. Uh, seeing none, uh, we will be adjourned and see you next month. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.